Uh, today, we're, we're extremely happy to have Joshua uh, Sanchez to, to, did I pronounce it correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, to, to give a talk. I mean, this is actually, we have mostly having senior people giving a talk, but, uh, you know, I was told by NSF and other people to promote junior people. So this is the mm -hmm. first time, actually, in a long time, we have a junior people. Joshua mm -hmm. is actually, a, a, you know, a, a postdoc now in, in coming school. He got his PhD degree two years ago from uh, uh, from UW, uh, Junhao Chu's uh, group. So he's uh, both an expert on, on transport as well as an expert on, on scattering experiment. And there has been a tremendous amount of debate about uh, you know, the, the origin of the microscopic origin of electronic nematicity in the case of iron selenium, because this compound does not have static order. So, so one you know, camp is saying that this is a purely electronic. The other camp is saying that uh, this is probably due to some sort of a, a spin driven so, so um, you know, Joshua is going to give us, uh, you know, his uh, perspective on, on how to look at this problem. Okay, so it's all yours, Joshua. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Pengsheng. And uh, just by the way, uh, if you know me well, then you know people call me Shua as well. So okay. Call me that. Um, yeah. So I'm Shua Sanchez. Like he said, I'm a postdoc, just a humble postdoc, and very excited to give this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about work that I first started doing way back in 2017 when I was a second year grad student. Um, and by work, I mean the, the broad category of work that I do, which is um, I have been working to develop a new combination of techniques where you can apply strain to a single crystal sample while you do transport measurements on it and while you do a variety of synchrotron X-ray measurements on it. Um, and that just that gives you the um, ability to kind of look with more precision at how quantities are changing in a sample. So this is work that I have done at Argonne. Um, I used to do it while I was a user, just like a regular user um, at Argonne while I was a grad student. Um, midway through my PhD, I won a fellowship from the DOE to spend a year at Argonne. Um, halfway through that year, uh, turns out a global pandemic happened and I ended up having to finish that time remotely. Uh, eventually, I got lab access again, and I'm continuing to uh, develop the technique and add more X-ray techniques to it now that I'm a postdoc and supported by an NSF fellowship. This right here is a picture of the uh, razor bill strain device that we use to apply strain, and it's connected to um, a cryostat that's X-ray compatible. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay, so why would we want to combine strain and X-ray? So there are a lot of strongly correlated phase transitions that we care about in condensed matter where rotational symmetry is broken when going through the transition. So just to name some of the most common ones, we have pneumaticity, charge density waves, spin density waves, orbital polarization, and different kinds of structural transitions. So all of these different kinds of transitions, since they uh, break rotational symmetry, they will couple to anisotropic strain. So if you can tune the anisotropic strain state of a sample, then you can couple to these phase transitions. And what does that let you do? Well, that lets you change lattice constants in a way that's distinct from hydrostatic pressure. Um, so it lets you tune different quantities just through tuning the lattice constants. Uh, maybe more importantly, it lets you change domain structures. So whenever you have one of these rotational symmetry breaking phases, you're going to get uh, different um, degenerate domains that form within a single sample. And if you want to measure anisotropies in those, then you need to apply strain in order to detwin them, basically. So the first motivation of developing this just was to apply enough strain to detwin a sample so that we could look at the structure of a sample using X-ray diffraction. But after that, we started finding all kinds of other ways to use the platform. Um, applying strain lets you change the transition temperatures as well um, and change the symmetry states, the band structures, the band gaps, etc. Um, so, so far we've um, made a lot of progress in using it. I won't uh, attempt to summarize everything that I've done with it, uh, but I've covered a lot of ground with it using different um, diffraction and spectros spectroscopic tools. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about orbital polarization in iron selenide. And so Hong Chung brought up that this has been um, somewhat of a controversial topic of whether nematicity in iron selenide is driven by uh, spin or driven by orbital polarization. 
Um, what I'm going to be showing is uh, X-ray linear dichroism data that shows that orbital polarization shows up on its own in iron selenide, and it seems to behave like a primary order parameter um, for the transition, which you could take to mean that it drives the nematic transition. And I will show you why we think that uh, through the course of this talk. I first just want to point out that this is a co-first author um, production between me and a graduate student from Ricardo Comin's group at MIT. So this is Connor Occhialini, who did a ton of work on this project with me. We did the beam times together um, and you know, wrote the paper together, data analysis together. And also the, uh, the measurements themselves and the, even the original thought to try and use XLD to do this kind of measurement came from the physicists at Argonne National Laboratory. So these four folks here um, have been my collaborators since I started going to Argonne and they played a very key role in making this project happen. Okay, so now let's talk about iron nictide nematicity. So I'm guessing that a lot of folks that are uh, in this talk are at least somewhat aware of iron-based superconductors and the pneumatic phase transition that happens. So I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly. Um, it, so here is barium iron arsenide. It's um, like the prototypical 122 iron nictide superconductor, which has layers of barium and then layers of iron arsenide. Um, as you put pressure on this material or as you dope it, you get a phase uh, diagram that looks like this, where we have three key phases that are present. We have the pneumatic transition, which is essentially a structural transition, where we go from a square lattice of iron atoms to a rectangular lattice, or really a tetragonal to orthorhombic transition. Below that, we get the spin density wave transition, and then with doping and pressure, we get superconductivity. So what can we look at in this pneumatic phase? So there's two things that are maybe easier than other uh, quantities to look at, which is the orthorhombicity of the lattice itself and the resistivity anisotropy. So we can one start- quick question. One quick question, very quick question. Yeah. So this, the drawing of this, uh, this twin domain, this AB, is it to real scale? Is it like this or is it exaggerated this AB difference? Is extremely AB exaggerated. Oh, this is, okay, very tiny, right? It's the, very tiny, yeah. Usually yeah. like 0.3%, and it gets smaller as you dope it. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Yep, but just, just for ease of, of looking at it. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And it's actually important that it's very small, as I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but yeah, so we can start off by positing that there's some pneumatic order parameter that breaks the rotational symmetry from C4 to C2. And I'm going to mark that with this psi here. And we maybe at the start of you know, this field, we didn't know what it was. So we just write it down and we see how it couples to other quantities. One of the, like, you know, the original quantity that we saw was the orthorhombic lattice distortion that happens. So we can couple it to the difference between the A and B lattice constants here and define it um, with a coupling constant lambda. We can also look at the resistivity anisotropy. So if we measure the resistivity along the long uh, lattice constant and then along the short and take the difference over the sum, then we define this quantity eta, which is the normalized resistivity anisotropy. And then we can compare those two quantities. And so if you're familiar with the work that's gone on in the past decade uh, or more with these materials, then you're very familiar with these plots. But what they show is um, with cooling, as you approach the pneumatic transition, uh, the A and B lattice constants become different from each other, and you get this smooth onset of orthorhombicity, which increases with cooling for different dopings. But like I said earlier, the size of that orthorhombicity is like 0.3% or less for most materials. Um, once we enter the pneumatic phase, we have these structural twin domains. And like I said before, uh, if we want to measure the transport anisotropy of these domains, then we have to apply strain in order to detwin it. So this was the first study that um, did that across the doping phase diagram where they used a clamp uh, in order to apply enough strain to detwin it, and they measured the resistivities along the different directions. And what you see is that there's a huge resistivity anisotropy uh, between the long and the short lattice directions in the pneumatic phase. In fact, it's on the scale of like a 30% difference compared to like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3% difference. So these, uh, these points put together 
uh, give a lot of evidence that electronic nematicity, or rather, nematicity itself is electronically driven. It's not structurally driven like a soft phonon mode would do. So transport data tells us that it is electronic in origin. And um, a more precise measurement made later above the nematic transition shows that the elastoresistivity diverges towards the transition, which really was the nail in the coffin for an electronic driver. So now we can try and look at um, the microscopics. So before we were looking phenomenologically at the structure and at the transport, but what is actually driving uh, the structure and the transport anisotropies? And that leads to this um, very straightforward question uh, without a straightforward answer, which is, is it orbital or is it spin interactions that lead to um, the anisotropies? So there is some really great work that was done uh, using ARPES on a strain twin sample that showed how the um, iron 3D XZ and YZ orbitals become uh, anisotropic in that their orbital occupation becomes different below the pneumatic transition. So if you do uh, an ARPES measurement of a sample that is twinned, so it has uh, this kind of domain and this kind of domain, and they're both present, then you'll pick up data from both kinds of domains, and that will kind of... Uh, that will kind of occlude the result that you're trying to find. But if you apply strain to detwin it, then you can measure the differences of the band energies in the different directions of a fully detwinned sample. And basically what you find in barium iron arsenide is that there is a net polarization towards the 3D XZ uh, band, or bands that come from that orbital of the iron atom. So we, we find that there's an orbital uh, degeneracy lifting in the nematic phase in this material, which could indicate that there is um, an orbital driven nematicity here. But we also have to look at the spin degree of freedom. So over here, what I'm showing is uh, this is the spin alignment within the spin density wave phase where it spins form stripes. So along one direction, all the spins point one way. And in the next uh, column, all the spins point the other way. So you get these stripes that form. And when you are in the pneumatic phase, uh, but above the spin density wave, or well, actually also above the pneumatic uh, transition, I guess even within the spin density wave, in all of these phases, you have fluctuations that can be left, right, or they can be up, down. So you have two different modes of spin fluctuations that are present, um, but their temperature dependencies tell you uh, how they couple to the lattice distortion. So in this plot, what we're looking at is taking a sample of barium iron arsenide where we apply enough strain that it will be fully detwinned within the pneumatic phase. And at high temperature, we see that there's not very much difference between like, let's call it a left, right and an up, down spin fluctuation. But with cooling towards the pneumatic transition, you see a divergence in one of these and a suppression in the other. And below the pneumatic transition, which uh, for the parent compound is very tightly coupled to the spin density wave transition, uh, you see that one type of spin fluctuation is dominant over the other. With further cooling as these spins um, order and they get a larger net moment, the fluctuations die off as you would expect them to. So what this shows is that spin fluctuations are tightly coupled to the idea of the pneumatic phase transition. So um, this, this data that I've shown here and a lot of other uh, publications uh, plus considering the phase diagram have led to a general consensus that nematicity specifically in the iron nictides is driven largely by spin fluctuations. And it could be a longer talk to go through all the other pieces of data that show that. Um, but I think that is the general consensus at this time that barium iron arsenide and other iron nictide superconductors are, the nematicity is driven by spin. So one consequence of that is that the spins are coupled to the lattice. So this project here showed NMR data of barium iron arsenide while they were applying strain to the sample um, and looking at spin resonance. And what they found is that on approach to the pneumatic transition, if you apply an increasing in-plane strain, you actually can shift the spectral weight between the two different types of spin fluctuations. So basically you can promote spin fluctuations along a particular direction by, train, uh, by changing the strain state. So that's the basic idea. So increasing the lattice orthorhombicity, you get more anisotropic spin fluctuations. So that fits really nicely with the idea of the spin-nematic transition.
Okay, so now that leads us to the question of, is iron selenide a spin pneumatic? And when you get into it, you find that there are quite a few phenomenological differences between the nictides and the chalcogenides, which is essentially iron selenide and its doped variants. Um, so the first thing I want to point out, um, which I'm sure many people you know, on this uh, call already know, um, barium iron arsenide and iron selenide have different structures. So iron selenide is basically the simplest structure out of all of the iron-based superconductors. It doesn't have an intermediary uh, layer of barium or anything else. And they have very distinct uh, phase diagrams. So here I'm comparing the pressure phase diagram of the parent compound, iron nictide, barium iron arsenide, and iron selenide. So if we look at the barium iron arsenide phase diagram, uh, one thing that we notice right away is that the pneumatic transition um, and the antiferromagnetic transition are tightly coupled. So as we go up in pressure, the pneumatic transition is suppressed and the antiferromagnetic transition is also suppressed. So they evolve together. And that is, um, that's another piece of evidence that suggests that nematicity in that case is driven by the spin fluctuations. So as you're suppressing the magnetic ordering, you're also suppressing the pneumatic order. Um, iron selenide has a very different picture. So when we put iron selenide under pressure, we get a phase diagram that looks like this. So the first thing um, that folks focused on in iron selenide is the fact that its pneumatic transition is not associated with a magnetic transition. So if we look at the parent compound uh, under zero pressure, as we cool down, we enter a pneumatic state at 90 Kelvin, roughly, and then somewhere around eight or nine Kelvin, we enter a superconducting state. And nowhere in this, um, this very large temperature range does it spontaneously magnetic order. So that's the first key indicator that there might be something else going on with nematicity in iron selenide. Then we can look at how the phase evolves under pressure. And what we find is this picture here where a magnetic order does eventually show up at large pressure, but it doesn't seem to be tightly coupled to this, originally, uh, this original pneumatic phase here. So what we see is as we go up in pressure, the pneumatic transition uh, suppresses in temperature, and all of a sudden we get a first order transition over into a spin density wave that also has the same kind of structural and magnetic order as the iron nictide um, spin density wave. Um, but you can see that it, it's first order. So it's not like it was buried. Well, I would say that it's not like it's buried here um, and is like a remnant of this pneumatic order. It seems to have its own dome that lives in the, this middle range of the pressure phase diagram. And also the, uh, the superconducting order seems to peak at the high pressure end of this uh, spin density wave dome. Um, and it doesn't really look like there's a pneumatic quantum critical point at this point. I guess I skipped that uh, in talking through the diagram, but on the barium iron arsenide side, when you get to the point of full suppression of the antiferromagnetic and uh, pneumatic phases, you reach the general area of maximum superconducting transition temperature. So that leads to this really nice idea that seems to work very well of pneumatic quantum criticality. On the iron selenide side, you don't see the peak um, of the superconducting transition in the vicinity of this suppressed pneumatic phase. So it seems like it's a more complicated story here. It's complicated further by looking at the evolution of iron selenide with sulfur doping and with further pressure. So if we look along this axis here, this is the zero pressure um, change in the phases with increasing sulfur content. So sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is sulfur of 0.04, so 4% sulfur, 8%, 12 and 17%. So the pneumatic transition at ambient pressure is suppressed with increasing sulfur doping. It disappears somewhere between 12 and 17. But what's really interesting to me here is that as you go up in pressure at these different dopings, uh, this first order transition between the pneumatic and the spin density wave phases uh, separates. So before they, they crashed into each other with no doping. Out here at middle doping and higher, um, you see that they actually occupy separate pieces of the phase diagram. Um, 
So that further complicates the idea that this spin, spin density wave phase um, is tightly connected to this ambient pressure pneumatic phase. Then we have to talk about the resistivity anisotropy. So to my knowledge from the papers I've read and uh, the iron nictide superconductors, when you put them under pressure and you measure the resistivity anisotropy uh, below the pneumatic transition, whatever sign that the resistivity anisotropy has, it maintains that sign through the entire temperature range. So for most iron-based superconductors that I'm aware of, there's a negative sign. So the resistivity um, uh, along the shorter B direction has a larger value than along A. For a few types of dopings, that can be flipped, and that's fine. But across temperature, it keeps the same sign. And that's true for a lot of different dopings in the nictides. In iron selenide, something pretty unusual happens. If we look at the resistivity anisotropy above the transition, it's initially positive, and that's fine. Some of the nictides are also positive. It shows a divergence towards the pneumatic transition, and that's great. The nictides also do that, so that indicates that this pneumatic transition uh, shows the same kind of um, electronic driver as in the nictides. But then it does something very strange once you cool below the pneumatic transition. It has uh, an initial positive value, and then it decreases with cooling. And somewhere about halfway towards zero Kelvin, uh, it actually flips sign. So it goes from having a positive value of the elastoresistivity to a negative value. Um, so this paper is from Coldea's group. And if they get very close to zero, they seem to see it uh, flip sign again. Um, I don't really know uh, what's going on there, but it's a very complicated picture. Um, and that complication should be a sign that something more complicated is happening here than in the nictides. The next thing that we can look at is the behavior of the lattice distortion below the superconducting transition. So if we look at the iron nictides, um, something very interesting happens. If we go to one of the dopings where superconductivity exists and coexists with the pneumatic transition, then we can track the orthorhombicity as a function of temperature into the superconducting state. So down here, we have the onset of the orthorhombicity at the pneumatic transition. And over here at these points, unfortunately, they're not clearly marked, but these points correspond to the onset of superconductivity. And something really cool happens. Um, as you go in doping towards stronger uh, superconducting orders, the orthorhombicity becomes more and more suppressed by the onset of superconductivity. So for instance, if we look at this blue one, uh, we hit a pneumatic transition, the orthorhombicity increases, we hit the superconducting transition, and the orthorhombicity decreases. And for some dopings, if you get right towards the critical point, uh, you can suppress it entirely. So this plays into this story that these pneumatic electrons are converting into Cooper pairs, which is another part of the story that fits really nicely with this idea that uh, there's, there's spin nematicity and critical behavior of those spin fluctuations gives you the superconductivity at high temperature. So this piece fits really nicely together. But then we can go and we can look at what happens in iron selenide. So this measure, measurement here didn't use x-ray diffraction. They did something even more precise, which is uh, thermal expansion. And they're contrasting barium iron arsenide, uh, cobalt doped barium iron arsenide, which has an onset of superconductivity, and iron selenide, which also has uh, superconductivity uh, without any doping. And what they find is that the cobalt doped uh, barium iron arsenide shows a suppression of orthorhombicity at the onset of superconductivity. So it's basically the same picture as this, uh, this magenta one on this side. So there's a feature in the thermal expansion that hits right as TC hits. On the iron selenide side, though, there really isn't a clear feature uh, at the onset of superconductivity. And it should be noted that uh, the scale of this is 10 times zoomed in compared to this scale. So there's really, really like only a very subtle change that's happening in this temperature range, and there's nothing specific that's happening at TC itself, and there's not a clear suppression of orthorhombicity due to the onset of superconductivity. And that leads to this idea that maybe um, nematicity and iron selenide isn't directly in competition uh, with the superconducting order. It could potentially be even cooperating with the superconducting order.
Then we have to talk about the microscopics of iron selenide. So if we repeat these kinds of ARPES measurements where we apply strain in order to detwin iron selenide and look at the change in the orbital occupation, then we see something kind of interesting. At the gamma point, we find that the 3D YZ orbital becomes more occupied uh, than the XC orbital. Again, these are the iron 3D orbitals. But if we follow this out to the M point, we find that the uh, 3D XZ orbital actually becomes more occupied. And there's a pretty large energy gap between the orbitals at the M point. So this is, a, this is an indicator, again, that there's orbital degeneracy lifting that could play a role in driving the ambient pressure uh, nematicity in iron selenide. Um, another really interesting piece of data comes from um, a different NMR study on, um, on iron selenide, which showed that once you enter the superconducting uh, phase, the spin fluctuations in the system actually start to damp. So even though up here the orthorhombicity is not damping, the spin fluctuations dampen once you enter the superconducting state. And that's really important because if we want to imagine that all iron-based superconductivity is mediated in some way by spin fluctuations, then it looks like iron selenide uh, has spin fluctuations that are also participating in the superconductivity. So this actually does piece pretty nicely with the idea of orbital-driven uh, superconductivity. Sorry, uh, sorry, orbital-driven nematicity. Okay, so now that I've put all of these pieces out on the table, I want to make a conjecture. So I'm not claiming this like 100%, I'm just putting out this conjecture. What if ambient pressure nematicity in iron selenide is orbital driven? What would that look like? So in this case, we would have this piece of the phase diagram where nematicity is driven by the orbital degree of freedom. And under pressure, we get a different kind of nematicity and spin density wave, uh, which is more spin driven. So in this case, we would have um, our ambient pressure superconductivity, which doesn't interact very strongly with this nematicity. And that could explain why the orthorhombicity isn't suppressed once we enter the superconducting state. And it also would allow this superconductivity, even under um, ambient conditions, to be driven by uh, spin fluctuations, because we, we saw that spin fluctuations will suppress in the superconducting state. So these different pieces of data do actually fit together pretty well in the schema of orbital driven nematicity in iron selenide. So now I'm going to take you through uh, the x-ray data that we use to further support this idea. Now, before I get to that data, I just want to make uh, one point for the audience. Um, I noticed while I was compiling this talk that there are very many beautiful figures that, uh, that I've shown you, very many beautiful figures that are out there uh, that unfortunately combine red and green together uh, to make different data points to make a contrast between them. And unfortunately, it's just the fact that a whole lot of people have red-green color blindness. And so those kinds of figures, um, um, it doesn't work for them. Actually, my office mate uh, that I share this room with, he's red, green, colorblind. So he wasn't able to identify uh, the number that's on this circle. And for all I know, other people on this talk um, also are not uh, able to distinguish the two colors. So I'd just like to politely ask everyone to keep this in mind when you're making figures in the future. Okay. So now I'd like to introduce um, basically like the technique combination that I've made in my work at Argonne. And I'm gonna start that by talking about a paper that came out two years ago. It's my first first author paper and it's my first uh, paper using this setup of strain and X-ray diffraction. Um, I think some folks here might be familiar with it, but I'm gonna run through uh, some of the biggest highlights of it. So in this work, I studied barium iron arsenide with cobalt doping. So this is a doping where I still have a pneumatic transition and it's split by about 10 Kelvin from the spin density wave transition. And that gives me a temperature window where I can study the pure pneumatic phase. Um, the claim to fame of this paper is that it's the highest precision measurement that's been done of detwinning the structural domains. So I'm using tunable strain in order to change the domain states 
and then I'm using X-ray diffraction to monitor how the lattice constants and how the domains are changing. So let's walk through this figure here. So this is a diagram of a single crystal sample mounted on two titanium plates. And then by applying voltage to the piezos, I can move these plates and I can apply strain to the sample. And my sample is oriented so that within the pneumatic phase, I have this A domain and this B domain, where the longer lattice constant of the A domain is aligned with the stress axis, and the shorter lattice constant uh, for the B domain is also aligned to the stress axis. So what that means is when I apply tension, I'm going to favor this A domain, and compression will favor the B domain. Now over here on this plot, um, right here in the middle is applying zero strain. To the right is tension, to the left is compression. When I'm at zero strain within the pneumatic phase, and I do um, an X-ray diffraction measurement along the stress axis, I get data that looks like this. So you got to imagine that this is a single line cut right here, which is showing two peaks. And those two peaks correspond to a longer lattice constant and a shorter lattice constant, which correspond to this longer and this shorter um, lattice constant here. Now, when I apply tension, what happens is I promote the A domain and I switch the system smoothly into mostly A. So I can um, characterize that by this black line here, where each one of these data points is a single X-ray scan um, that's been analyzed to give me the ratio between the A and the B domains. So basically, um, under compression, I'm fully in the B domain. And with tension, I move fully into the A domain. And at a middle strain, I can smoothly switch between the two domains. And one thing that is really great um, about using X-ray diffraction to monitor the strain detwinning is not only am I getting information about the domain composition, but I can also look at the lattice constants. So what I see is that in a small strain uh, range where I'm just detwinning the sample, I'm not actually changing the values of the, of the lattice constants. So you could imagine that if the lattice constants were very soft, as I apply strain, I'm partially detwinning, but are also like partially deforming the domains and changing the lattice constants. But luckily what we see that that's not what happens here. So that gives us confidence that we can apply enough strain to um, just just barely detwin the sample without doing additional lattice constant changes. Because those additional lattice constant changes would uh, induce other anisotropies in the system that we don't want if we want to study the spontaneous anisotropies within a single perfectly detwinned domain. Okay, so what kinds of information can we get out from this kind of measurement? So if I go to a fixed temperature and I apply strain and I do these X-ray diffraction cuts, then I can get data about uh, how the transport is related to the lattice constants and the domain structure. So first off, the lattice constants here, I can define in orthorhombicity just from the splitting between the two lattice constants at the zero strain point. So that gives me my structural anisotropy. Um, then by applying strain, I can switch between the barely detwinned A domain and the barely detwinned B domain. So that gives me access to the resistivity along the A direction and the B direction. So those points are marked here. So this blue line is basically the resistivity at every fixed strain point as I do a loop from max compression to tension and back. So that's what this is. This is going all the way out and going all the way back. And if you didn't have, if you didn't have access to the X-ray diffraction, uh, you wouldn't know if um, you've fully detwinned or not. And if you're off by a little bit in how much you're detwinning, you can see that you would get a very large error in uh, what the spontaneous resistivity along that direction is. But with this combination of techniques, I can pull out what the spontaneous resistivity along the two directions is, and then define the resistivity and isotropy. So then that looks like this. If I do this at different temperatures, I can get a plot that shows the smooth splitting of the two lattice constants when I hit the pneumatic transition, and also the smooth splitting of the resistivities when I hit the pneumatic transition. Then I can look at the normalized anisotropies of the two. So I see um, an orthorhombicity that smoothly increases at the pneumatic transition, and also a resistivity anisotropy that smoothly increases. And they have the same mean field ordering uh, behavior. They, they, um, they fit to the same line, essentially, with only a shifted magnitude. So what this shows us 
uh, for the first time is that there is a very clear mean field behavior of the spontaneous resistivity and isotropy. And that shows that the resistivity and isotropy behaves like a thermodynamic order parameter. That means it behaves like a proxy for the pneumatic order. And this hadn't been, we hadn't been able to show this in the past because we didn't have um, a clear indicator of how much we've detwinned the sample. Because if you apply any extra strain at all, you get additional resistivity and isotropy, and that can blur this picture. But by doing this combination of techniques, I, I was able to show that the resistivity and isotropy really does follow the pneumatic order parameter um, in the pneumatic phase. Now, this was cool, but this transport measurement is not the same thing as making a measurement of the microscopic pneumatic order parameter. It's just a measurement of this transport proxy for the pneumatic order parameter. What I'm about to show you now in iron selenide is an advancement in this technique where we actually can make a measurement of something that's very close to what could be the pneumatic order parameter, which is namely the orbital polarization. So this work now is building on the previous work. I'm going to use strain to detwin iron selenide, and then I'm going to use X-ray uh, linear dichroism to measure the orbital polarization. All right. So here I'm going to uh, take a sample of iron selenide and glue it to this titanium bridge. So um, there's basically two methodologies for applying strain to samples. You can either glue a sample to a bridge or you can glue a sample over a gap. In this case, um, iron selenide is relatively soft and we found that it just worked a lot better by putting it on a titanium bridge. Then we um, put transport wires on it and we did X-ray measurements on it. So to initialize the sample, we cooled it down under zero strain to uh, 25 Kelvin, which is below the pneumatic transition. And then we applied enough tension to partially detwin it. Then we did our X-ray measurements. So from X-ray diffraction, we found that we had, in this particular strain state, we had 75% A domain, which is the tensile favored domain, and 25% B domain. So this inset figure shows you that. So this is essentially a line cut at one particular temperature and strain that shows that we've partially detwinned the sample. Then we can do uh, X-ray absorption uh, spectroscopy. So that gives us this top plot here. So what we're doing is we're sending in um, X-rays that are um, linear vertical and linear horizontal polarized. And we move the incident energy of the X-rays through the iron K edge. Um, yeah, through the iron K edge. And then we get an absorption step that looks like this. So we have no absorption below the edge and high absorption above it, uh, with the corner basically being given by this feature B right here. So that's the usual center of the absorption edge. But you can see that there are two distinct peaks around this feature B, and B itself has a, a small little bump here. So these peaks are pretty well understood in the literature. Um, if you go to our paper, you can find the, the citations for it. But they give us extra evidence about the local uh, nature of the iron atom. So because this is an iron K edge absorption, um, you can think about this as the X-ray is in, in an individual X-ray is interacting with an individual iron atom. So it gives you um, a way to probe the local environment of that iron atom. So this B feature is the normal edge. The C feature comes from extra scattering of electrons in the vicinity of the iron atom, and it becomes sensitive to the lattice distortion around the iron atom. But this feature A here um, is telling us something about the local hybridization of the P and D orbitals, which I'm about to show you. Um, but first, I just want to point out that instead of taking the sum, if you take the difference of the two uh, linear polarizations of the X-rays, then you get a plot that looks like this. So this becomes our XLD across the full energy scan. And you can see that there's um, a peak associated with A, B, and C here. Right, but now, so if we focus on this A peak, um, we can put together a model that looks like this. Um, so since this is a K edge um, absorption, we are talking about moving electron from the 1S into the iron 4P orbital. That is not a direct probe of the iron 3D orbitals, but the 4P and the 3D orbitals have some hybridization, which allows us to measure 
the polarization of the 3D orbitals by looking at the polarization of the 4P orbitals, basically. Um, so you can, again, you can go through our supplement and see um, what we work through to arrive at this. But this is essentially the basis of how we're able to probe the 3D orbitals. And this isn't uncommon. We do this in uh, hard X-ray XMCD for magnetic order all the time as well. Um, so if you work through the details, you find that having a positive XLD for the orientation of X-rays in the sample that we have um, should correspond to having a net polarization of the 3D YZ orbital. And this actually agrees with the ARPES data that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, so basically, we're on track for looking at like the gamma point uh, anisotropy of the iron orbitals. Okay, so now we can consider what happens to the XLD as we move across a large strain range from a little bit of compression because it's, it's hard to compress the, the titanium bridge to a very large value of tension because it's easy to apply tension to the bridge. So then we get line cuts that look like this. So each one of these is um, the difference of the two linear polarizations of the X-rays across this large energy range. And again, we have the A, B, and C features. And we, we can see very clearly that when we move from compression to tension, the sign of these peaks will flip. So this, uh, this A peak feature here starts negative under compression, and it becomes positive under tension. If we plot these line cuts together, we can get um, this kind of area plot, where this feature right here is our peak A data. So we can see, again, under compression, we have a negative peak here that corresponds to this negative peak, and then it quickly moves into a large positive value that saturates. So now, if you see this bracket here, if we sum up the intensity underneath this peak by using a fixed energy range, then we can define these points here. So these points are the total intensity at this point or in this range as a function of strain. I should mention um, again that we're below the pneumatic transition, but we're not all the way down. Okay, so under compression, we see that the total value of the XLD for peak A is negative. Again, it increases very linearly with applied tension, and then it saturates. So this saturation behavior is really important because it's going to tell us about how the orbitals are connected to the lattice. And the orbital susceptibility is connected to the lattice. OK, so now to reveal the rest of the plot, um, this red line here corresponds to the point where the sample has become fully detwinned. So at, at every strain value where we were taking XLD data, we were also taking X-ray diffraction data. So at these points, we're looking at the in-plane lattice constant aligned with the stress direction. And at these, this point, um, in the second panel, we're looking at the out-of-plane lattice constant. And what you can see is that for a small compressive range up to a medium tension range, these lattice constants are essentially flat. So that corresponds to the strain range where the sample is being detwinned. Past this point, marked by the red line, we see that the lattice constants shoot off and in the direction that they're supposed to. So increasing tension makes the strain aligned lattice constant bigger and it makes the out of plane lattice constant smaller. So both of these lattice constants show this change in behavior at the same strain value, which is marked by this red line. So this red line from the lattice constants defines the red line that's now marked here on the XLD. And we see that it's past this point that the XLD saturates. So this right here is the key indicator that's the heart of the paper, which is that the orbital polarization is saturating once the sample is fully detwinned. What that relates to then is this idea that the orbital polarization is spontaneous. So it's not being driven by the lattice distortion. If it were being driven by the lattice distortion, this would continue to increase as you increase the lattice distortion. In a sense, it exists prior to the lattice distortion. And there's a word that I'm going to use later, which is that makes it like a primary uh, order parameter for the pneumatic phase. Now, I'll just quickly point out that the elastoresistivity has a very large uh, slope change past this point of detwinning. And I'm going to come back to this at the end of the talk. But OK, so we did this uh, really careful study at a single temperature. What does this look like at different temperatures? So 
what I'm showing you here, um, all of this data is represented in these boxes here. We basically went to a single temperature and we changed the strain state from lightly compressive up to maximum tension. And we looked at the change in the XLD. So 150 Kelvin is uh, 60 Kelvin above the transition. And we see that by even by applying a very large amount of strain, we can't induce a very large XLD signal. Um, as we cool down and we hit the actual pneumatic transition at 90 Kelvin, we see that um, we can apply strain and get a medium value of the XLD signal. So we're able to get some orbital polarization, but only after we apply a large amount of strain. Then with cooling below the transition, uh, we can use X-ray diffraction and optical birefringence measurements to work out the range where the sample becomes fully detwinned. And that's given um, with the, these like generous width uh, dotted lines here. This point is showing us where the sample becomes fully detwinned. And again, you see at 50 Kelvin and then again at 30 Kelvin, past the point of full detwinning, the sample is now saturated. The XLD is saturated, which means the orbital polarization is saturated. So if we put all of this data together, it looks like this, where you have this increasing susceptibility as you get colder and then a saturation at low temperature. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, this looks just like the magnetization of a ferromagnet in a magnetic field, then I would agree with you. Uh, I think that that was, uh, you know, seeing this data, this was like a very clear indicator for us that the orbital polarization is spontaneous and it is uh, lattice independent. The changes that we're seeing with strain here are only coming from changing the domain population state. Before, if we're averaging over two different domains, the, the two effects cancel each other out. And once we fully detwin, we're only getting a signal from one domain. And then we get a large signal that increases as we go colder and it saturates at large strain. So that's, that's essentially like the key data for this story about orbital polarization. So now, how does this fit into the discussion between spin nematicity and orbital nematicity? So I want to just lay out kind of almost like a flow chart. Uh, we can come back to this in the Q&A. This is how I understand what I think I should see if I were to do this measurement under two different models. If I were in the spin pneumatic model, as I increase tension past full detwinning, I would expect to continue to increase the spin fluctuations. Um, I showed you that NMR paper earlier. If the spins aren't ordered yet, then increasing the lattice orthorhombicity should encourage them to get closer towards ordering, and it should increase the spin fluctuations. If the orbital anisotropy were only driven by the spin fluctuations, then I would expect the orbital anisotropy to also increase as I apply strain past full detwinning. That is not what we saw here. What we saw instead is that as we increase tension past full detwinning, the spontaneous orbital anisotropy remains saturated. Even so, I would fully expect the spin fluctuations to continue to diverge as I apply strain because I'm making the lattice more friendly towards those spin fluctuations and I'm like helping it get closer towards ordering. That's the basic idea. So from these pieces of data, that, uh, that leads me to this idea that iron selenide has an orbital driven nematicity. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and ask Peng Chung, um, how much time do I have left? You have, uh, you can talk about for five more minutes. Oh, five more minutes? Yeah. Great. Then this, uh, this gets us to the, uh, the encore uh, of the talk, which is to look more carefully at the elastoresistivity. So if I take this XLD data that I just showed you as a function of temperature, um, I can compare that to the resistivity that I measured at the exact same time that this data was being taken. And that gives me this data here. So this is XLD versus strain, and this is resistivity versus strain. And just looking at this by eye, you can see that there's some similar shapes here, but they actually invert as a function of temperature. If you plot the resistivity versus the XLD, then you get a plot that looks like this. If we're at the pneumatic transition, there is a very large slope. So the resistivity seems to change very strongly with the orbital polarization. But as we get colder below the pneumatic transition, we see this slope starts to drop off and it eventually goes negative. 
So this lines up with the sign change in the elasto-resistivity that we saw earlier in the introduction. So why would that happen? So these red arrows are showing the point where the sample is fully detwinned. So in this strain range, basically we're not making changes to the lattice constants, but as a function of temperature, the resistivity and isotropy is dropping. So if we're thinking about a single domain, we're going to have some orbital polarization in it, and we're going to have some spontaneous value of the spin fluctuations, and presumably both contribute to the elasto-resistivity. As long as I'm only detwinning the sample, I shouldn't see a change in the orbital polarization or in the spin fluctuation spectra. So my resistivity should stay linear to strain because it's basically just following the detwinning. But when I get past full detwinning, uh, my orbital polarization stays saturated and I start to see um, other effects that show up. But within that domain, um, since the slope is changing as a function of temperature, that would suggest that the way that the spin, uh, spin fluctuations are contributing to the resistivity and isotropy is changing as a function of temperature. That's my basic idea. So the reason that this is dropping, I'm going to say, is because the spin fluctuations are contributing a negative elasto-resistivity that's continuing to diverge as you cool down towards zero Kelvin. All right, so these slopes here, I'm going to put them onto this phase diagram here. So these blue squares um, at a given temperature is basically the value of the slope. So this large slope here at 90 Kelvin is that blue square. As it goes smaller and gets negative, you get these blue squares here. I'm going to take you through a couple more pieces of transport very quickly. Um, if we go to a fixed amount of strain and we cool down under that fixed strain, then we get data that looks like this. So if we measure the XLD as a function of temperature under this large fixed strain, then we see an XLD uh, signal that diverges towards the pneumatic transition. So this looks pretty cool. Uh, this looks like the same kind of like, uh, uh, it's reminiscent of a, the diverging elasto-resistivity or diverging spin fluctuations that uh, we've seen in a lot of other works. Um, and it's further evidence towards this idea of orbital driven pneumaticity. Now, as the XLD diverges, the resistivity anisotropy also diverges. And the ratio of the resistivity to the uh, XLD stays roughly constant above the pneumatic transition. Below the pneumatic transition, the XLD under large strain stays saturated while the resistivity drops. So if I put this data on my phase diagram, these points correspond to these open brackets. So above the transition, it's, you know, it's roughly constant. It's roughly in the same ballpark value. And below the transition, it drops rapidly. There's one more piece of data to look at. So I showed you this plot earlier with my XLD and my um, elasto-resistivity. If I now, again, plot my elasto-resistivity against my simultaneously collected XLD, I get a plot that looks like this. So within a strain range that corresponds to detwinning the sample, the resistivity and isotropy stays perfectly linear to the XLD. But once I get past the point of full detwinning, the resistivity and isotropy has a huge change with strain, even as the XLD stays completely flat. So even though the orbital polarization isn't changing at all, the resistivity and isotropy is changing quite a bit. And again, I would say that what's happening here is as I make the sample more orthorhombic with increasing strain, I'm promoting spin fluctuations, I get more spin scattering, and I get this extra contribution to the elasto-resistivity. It's a relatively simple picture, but I think that it gives, uh, it gives an idea for what might be happening here. So I put this all together, and we, we, have, at least, uh, we have at least a picture that we can talk about for why we have a sign change in the elasto-resistivity below the pneumatic transition. OK, so in conclusion, I showed you a collection of data using strain and x-rays in iron selenide, where we find that the orbital polarization diverges towards the pneumatic transition, and it saturates once we apply enough strain to fully detwin it. As we get colder uh, below the transition, the value also increases towards its own natural um, saturation value. And from these pieces of data, I would suggest that orbital polarization plays the driving role for pneumaticity. So we can call it the primary order parameter of pneumaticity for the ambient pressure iron selenide parent compound.
And then if we look at the elastoresistivity, some of these details of how it behaves under strain uh, before and after detwinning gives some evidence, um, I will claim, will give some evidence that spin fluctuations are uh, contributing separately from the orbital polarization. Yep, and that is my talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very, very nice talk. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so so you made you made your story. So, so any, any questions? I'll try to ask a bit later. Okay, Ilya, yeah. Well, very nice talk. Um, Thanks. I have uh, uh, the following question. So um, the orbital polarization in iron selenium is clear. Um, what is known about the orbital polarization in one to two compound, or let's say in the other system where uh, we know that there has been fluctuation? Obviously, there should be some orbital polarization because the symmetry is also lowered. And one of the slides you mentioned that it's opposite to the iron selenium, but could you please comment on this? What is known about orbital polarization in, in let's say, conventional pneumatic state in iron nictides? Yeah, I would say that a lot is known about it. There's um there's a wealth of ARPES studies that uh, have looked at the the changes in uh, the, the the band occupations of different orbital character um, across the full Bruin zone um, and across doping. Um, so. The main thing that I would say, at least for me, is that I don't think that the, well, I guess the, the main comparison is that the band structure just is different between iron selenide and barium iron arsenide. Uh, and I'm not sure why exactly that difference would lead to a different character of the pneumatic state, but um, it's pretty natural to, to think that there could be a pretty substantial difference between them since uh, they have you know, different numbers of pockets and different uh, orbital character. But you don't know for sure. So the, the statement is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just interested in number. So because you said that the yeah. YZ larger than XZ, so it, what is known about, uh, let's say, 1 to 2? Because there are still only three orbitals, right? So there is XZ, YZ, and XY. So uh, Well, we I know... guess, um, is there something specific that you want to ask about that? Um... Well, whether the sign of the, let's say, orbital polarization is the same. So, so that... Why is he dominate or you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, well, I think that there are ARPES um, experts uh, on this call who would be able to- Maybe, uh, maybe Amelia, Amelia can, can, can address it better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, I mean, uh, establishing the exact orbital character uh, in an experiment, I think is very difficult because you need to know exactly how the light is polarized and the orientation of the crystal and uh, the matrix element. So uh, I think it's it's a complicated issue to to be sure of, about the orbital character. And you know the difference that there exists between them, but uh, to be in absolute units is not straightforward. Okay. Uh, and I have a question myself, uh, very interesting work. Um, so I have a, actually a technical question because you are using light uh, with different polarization here uh, to probe uh, the, you're trying to probe the occupation numbers of different orbitals. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, you know, when you use different lights, you will have different matrix elements. Mm -hmm. So LV and LH will, will kind of be sensitive to one orbital or the other. And then you subtract the two of them. Yeah. So my question is, is there a reason why you didn't uh, subtract the strain data versus the non-strain data as well to see how much you promoted that particular orbital for a different polarization? And what type, I mean, these effects are very, very small. And when you change light polarization, uh, the beam itself has, it won't be exactly in the same place. So how do you account for any potential exper uh, you know, um, um, experimental issues? Well, okay, so on the last point about the beam not being in the same place, um, the spot size is very large in this case. So mm -hmm. we're covering um, the full width of the sample. Mm -hmm. So um, even if there is a shift in the beam, like we're, we're, we're probing the same volume, we're probing a large volume of the mm -hmm. sample. Um, even so, it, it is a relatively surface uh, sensitive um, measurement, just in the sense that the penetration depth is not super deep compared to like x-ray mm -hmm. diffraction. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But let's see, uh, what was the rest of the question? So sorry, a, you said something about like subtracting the strain versus the unstrained values. Yes, yeah. And also you you use the mixing with the charcoal gen as a way to get your information. But did you try also the selenium edge? Did we try the selenium edge? Um, I don't believe that we, hmm. I don't believe that we ever did a measurement of the selenium edge. So um, there is to so subtract two two signals which actually look at different orbitals, you know, at different matrix elements. That's what for me it's um, harder to understand exactly what the result is of that. Um, okay. So if you are above the pneumatic transition, then the 3D XZ and YZ orbitals are degenerate. And even under zero strain, you'll end up seeing um, zero XLD signal. You'll see a large you know, XAS signal, but no XLD. Um, if you cool below the transition, you still don't see an XLD because you have an equal population of the two domains. Um, mm -hmm. But once you apply strain, then you're breaking the symmetry of the occupation, and then you'll see a net XLD signal. But I think, am I hearing you say that like the concern is around um, like strain uh, unequally tuning the the absorptions of the two um, orbitals? Well, she was maybe concerned about the matrix element. The matrix, matrix element, element. matrix okay. element issues. Yeah, will be different in LV and LH effectively. So you're not probing the same thing. Hmm. We might have to talk about this uh, later. Okay. okay. Which I'd be happy to. Okay. Yeah, Chimel. Um, yeah, so uh, very nice talk. Hello. Very nice practice. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess I, I, I'm a bit confused about how sharp the statement is. Uh, you know, the orbitals and anisotropy, spin anisotropy, and all these things are coupled together. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, uh, the, the two things that in my mind uh, have reasonable way of inferring what's a driving force. One is yeah. this. Uh, cross susceptibility from the Landau analysis that the Stanford group uh, did uh, with regard to phono lattice contribution versus electronic contribution. Mm -hmm. And the other is you actually go through to the to the dynamic the dynamics and see you know which uh, energy range of fluctuations in which channels um, would be primarily uh, driving the formation of a nematicity. But uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it seems to me that the polarization is a static quantity, is it? The uh, optical polarization, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if I only know something at the uh, small frequencies, uh, it might be. It, it seems to me that naively it would be very hard to infer, you know, what what's actually driving in the end uh, the nematicity. So I wonder whether you've thought about that. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think um, maybe in the middle of the project, we talked about trying to get an even more microscopic description of why the orbital polarization occurs. Um, and ultimately, I think that we just don't have data that supports different microscopic uh, explanations. So we sort of left this analysis at the level of we observe this orbital polarization um, which has a very local character, like this is a very local measurement towards uh, the, towards particular iron atoms. Um, but as to like the origin of the orbital polarization itself, um, I think that that stays an open question in, uh, in I, models. I, I, yeah, I, I thank you for, for that comment. I mean, I, I'm not particularly concerned about the origin of the uh, uh, orbital polarization. Sure. I was more concerned about knowing what the orbital polarization is doing Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, how much information you really have in addressing the question, you know, what is driving the nematicity, right? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, say, the spin channel, the anisotropy information is actually available over a very, very large uh, uh, range of energies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that would help. So yeah, we, we, We've done, we done that on. measurement, right, in, in neutron scattering. You know, we did the X-ray scattering experiment, basically looking at the D-twin sample. Yeah, this actually, you know, come back to the question that I was going to ask you. I mean, your, your central claim is that the, when samples are fully detuned, 
that uh, your orbital, you know, uh, uh, occupancy is completely saturated, and and you you suggested that the, the spin occupancy are not completely saturated, you know, will yeah. continue to increase with string, and that assumption I, I don't think is actually correct. I mean, I don't think there's any measurement, you know, suggesting that when you fully detrain the sample, if you further string it in the ordered state, you can you can you know change the spin anisotropy further. I don't think there's evidence for that. So so yeah. yeah. And, so in, know, in the in the in the in the order uh, in the in the paramagnetic state, yes. It, when you go above Tn, if you string, you know, you put a string on the sample, you can clearly see anisotropy uh, in spin yeah. excitations between one hundred one hundred one. But but in the fully ordered state, I believe once you fully ordered it, you know, a single domain sample, the magnetic anisotropy is more or less a sort of a, a fixed as well. But you know, within a certain frequency range, as Chimio has said. At high energy, they're similar, but low energy below certain frequency, you know, they're more or less sort of fixed as well. And so, you so you're, that, you're, you're, that's for iron selenide as well. I, I believe, I mean, it, it, I believe it will, it will be the case as well. Yes. I mean, I think we have a, a paper on that. Yeah. So I just want to say that one of the one of the things that I like about uh, the work that mm -hmm. I do is having access to tunable strain. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I only had access to zero strain and like a very large strain value, I mm -hmm. could see a difference between the two. I, I agree. That, that That's really the unique aspect of your work, which mm -hmm. I really, you know, yeah, it's very appreciative. Yeah. 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 Can, I, can I follow up, follow up very quickly, Penche? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe, I, I mean, I, I like your work. It's, 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 it's very you. nice. Um, so just maybe just turn around. Suppose uh, I want to yeah. see uh fluctuations in the orbital channel in, in particular you know the anisotropy in this particular symmetry channel over some extended uh energy range frequency range um uh, like neutron has done that all the way to uh, 100 or 150 mev right so so what what's the technique uh, uh, one could envision uh revealing that information in the orbital fluctuation sector Because polarization at the end of the day it's just static. You you can I guess you can you can look for for use rigs to look at orbitons, <laughs> but that's very hard. <laughs> yeah. But you don't you don't have the answer. I just, just I thought it was an interesting question as a mm -hmm. discussion. It is a good question, and uh, I actually am excited to see further developments of doing uh, like large tunable strains with rigs. That's mm -hmm. something that I'm talking with folks in Ardon about doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just because then it would be really nice to have plots that look like this for um, you know other techniques, so that we can just get like uh, you know finer strain steps and see uh, see what what quantities do saturate, what quantities don't, because that in, in my opinion that gives us more information about you know what's driving transitions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any any other question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a very very nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay.